Shen Songwen is a truly distinctive modern Chinese writer. He is distinctive in terms of his literary style, his imagery, his use of language, his settings. He is also distinctive in terms of his biography. Many of his life experiences were completely unlike those of his contemporaries. And in this brief video lecture about his life, I'll talk mostly about his biography and just a little bit about how it relates to his literary output. If you're curious about Shen Songwen's works, I would suggest that you check out the three video lectures I've created about his novella, Border Town, a classic work of lyricism from 1934. But what was it that led Shen Songwen in 1988 to be nominated for and almost conferred the Nobel Prize for Literature? Unfortunately, he died before the award could be conferred upon him, but it just goes to show that Shen Songwen's acclaim is not just domestic, he also has many fans and admirers around the world. He is of mixed ethnic background, he grew up in a rural part of Hunan province, and he was very interested in local customs and beliefs and cultures. Shen Songwen's hometown was in southern China in Hunan province on the border with Sichuan province. And a lot of the kind of commerce and the culture of his hometown was very closely tied to the river. Shen Songwen's life could have turned out very differently if he had stayed in his hometown. When he was a teenager, he was essentially conscripted into a warlord army. He had something of an office job, but this is a very precarious position to be in. He witnessed beheadings. He witnessed the defilement of corpses. He witnessed a lot of the internecine strife that affected China during the Republican era. And if he had stayed there, he could have met a violent end. But this was someone who was very much an autodidact, someone who was a striver, and who in 1919 heard this clarion call from the May 4th revolutionaries up in Beijing, and a few years later was inspired to himself leave his hometown and go up to Beijing and try to enter the literary scene, which he did successfully. The so-called May 4th movement was a response to the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, when the Western powers made the colossal blunder of handing Germany's concessions in Shandong province over not to China, but to Japan. This led to decades of war and tremendous misery within China. And of course, this was completely unacceptable to people of conscience within China who took to the streets in Beijing, as well as in other cities, and essentially felt like not only were things wrong with China politically and militarily, but also culturally, and the Chinese people needed to change the way that they expressed themselves, how they spoke and how they wrote. They needed a new vernacular language, they needed to be in touch with local traditions, and they needed to push China in a progressive path. Liberation of the sexes, equality, and political reform. So Shen Tsong Wen was this young man in the countryside who took a risk in going to Beijing. And he was able through his own uh, initiative and his sheer talent to essentially make himself into a self-taught writer. He applied for admission at Peking University. He was not accepted, but he was able to audit classes. So when Shen Tsong Wen was in Beijing, he was relying partly on local hometown networks. A fellow Hunan native, Dingling, who was a literary celebrity, helped to put him up. He lived for a while with her and her husband, Hu Yeping, a leftist who was actually executed for his politics. And he was able to ingratiate himself with A-list members of China's literary establishment, such as the poet Xu Zhimu and the essayist and short story writer Yu Dafu. He later moved down to Shanghai with Dingling and her husband. In 1927, this was in the midst of the warlord era, so there was a lot of strife, particularly in northern China, and things really got too hot for intellectuals in Beijing in 1926, when there were massacres of students and many threats, death threats, against professors and writers who spoke up against the local power. A lot of Shen's literary career really blossomed in Shanghai. Some of his teaching positions came about thanks to the patronage of leading intellectuals and political figures like Hu Shi, who later became China's ambassador to the United States. And one of these appointments in particular had a tremendous personal impact on Shen Song Wen's life. He was teaching at a secondary school and fell in love with one of his students. And he started courting her with love letters assiduously for months. And she became sick of this and she posted all of his love letters around the school saying, look at the disgusting things this teacher is writing to me. But so he was completely humiliated, but he ended up continuing the courtship and eventually winning her over with his devotion and sincerity, as well as perhaps his literary prowess. So talk about the power of writing. 
Uh, during the war years, he, like many intellectuals who were teaching the academy, had to flee the Japanese advance. And so he ended up teaching at the prestigious Southwestern United University, an amalgamation of several of China's top universities. He, in the late 1940s after the war, also taught for a while at Peking University. So after 1949, there's essentially a crisis in mid-century for China as a whole. The civil war had been decisively won by the communists. The nationalists were put to flight. They fled to Taiwan. China was in ruins, the infrastructure, millions of people had died. And there were a lot of purges of traitors and there was a lot of factional fights. So Guo Mo Ruo, a very prominent communist critic, essentially accused Shen Songwen of being a pornographic writer. And some of the criticism directed at Shen was so personal and so intense that he attempted suicide. Fortunately, his suicide attempt failed, but this essentially ended his literary career. And he retreated, like many intellectuals in the early Mao era, into academic work. And so he became something of a self-taught expert in Peking opera costumes and other antiquities. And he did publish about those, but essentially his literary career was over. In the early 1980s, like a lot of writers from Republican China who had been essentially blacklisted for a couple decades, his works were rediscovered. And then the acclaim just grew and grew. His works were anthologized, they were endlessly reprinted, leading up to that Nobel Prize nomination. But Shen Tsongwen's reputation back in his heyday is quite interesting, that he did not follow a traditional path. He had not kind of worked his way up the ranks through prestigious universities with an elite education. And so we have this uh, contemporary portrait by his former colleague, Chen Zhongshu, who also taught at Southwestern United University in the late 1930s during the war. And he describes Shen in this story, this is kind of a disguised version of Shen Tsongwen, as being someone who looks very genteel and very literary, but writes about himself and presents himself as having this really violent background and that he's had all of these amazing life experiences that are totally shocking and completely intriguing to young impressionable people who have only ever lived at home and in the safe confines of the academy. And so I think this is a story well worth reading. It also includes some Romana Clef satires of Zhou Zoren, the essayist Lin Yu Tang, a cosmopolitan intellectual, his representative works are, well, it's hard to choose a really representative selection because he wrote so much and so much of his work is good. Volumes and volumes of short stories and essays which are well worth reading. And so I don't think any single one can be truly representative, but I would mention a couple here. Uh, one is the story Xiao Xiao. This is a beloved story, which is kind of pokes fun at some of the sensibilities and the moral positions of conservative people in the countryside. And so you have this young woman who has been, she's a teenager, but she is married to an infant through an arranged marriage. And so he cannot perform the conjugal duties. They're married in name, but not in fact. So she's kind of waiting for him to grow up and they can consummate the union. She can produce a son and uh, the family can be happy and get a return on its investment, so to speak. But unfortunately in the interim, she is impregnated by a local boy who then runs off and abandons her. And this is totally shameful. And so the family wants to either return her to the surviving family member of the elder generation who doesn't want her back. So what are they going to do? Well, according to Confucian morality, as they understand it, she should be drowned. But then she gives birth to a son. And after she gives birth to the son, well, things change and now everything's okay. The son can be adopted into the family, even though he's just a few years younger than his adoptive father, who is still only just entering adolescence. So it's a very charming story. And Xiao Xiao herself has some subjectivity too, right? She sees these co-ed students from a local school and kind of yearns to become one of them, even though she's mercilessly teased about that aspiration. And so what's going to happen uh, with this? We have a very sweet ending to the story. This story is very, very different in terms of tone and uh, the feeling it leaves the reader with when you compare it to some of the works inspired by Shen Tsongwen's time in the army and witnessing not just the violence of army life, but also some of the boredom. So three men and one woman, I'm not going to summarize the whole plot now, but this is a story partly about boredom, about people who are soldiers and kind of killing time and waiting for their next posting or the next battle and just hanging out at the tofu shop where they meet this 
beautiful woman who then for some unknown reason commits suicide and then mysterious things happen to her corpse and one of the three men disappears and it's later found out that the corpse has been defiled. So there's this bizarre necrophilic um, kind of tales of the strange feeling of it that reminds a lot of readers with a knowledge of pre-modern Chinese literature of all of these bizarre tales from the pre-modern imperial period. And so there's a lot that was very problematic ideologically in terms of the, like there's no redemption at the end of some of these stories. There's no revolutionary message. And so these were rejected by some of his contemporaries, even though a lot of them make for fantastic, but sometimes very chilling and unsettling reading. So you can read a few of these stories like Xiao Xiao and Three Men and One Woman in this collection, just to give one other example of how different and how versatile uh, Shen Song Wen's writing could be, he also wrote this kind of farcical parody based on Alice's adventures in Wonderland, in which Alice goes down the rabbit hole and ends up in China. And so how would someone of Alice's sensibilities interpret what she sees in contemporary China? How would she interpret the poverty? How would she interpret the literary posers? And so we have all kinds of modest proposals being thrown out for China. Unfortunately, this story has not yet been translated, but it was part of this move to kind of look at China with foreign eyes and to kind of use this foreign character from kind of a nonsensical uh, child's tale, but also a masterpiece of world literature, and to use that as a mechanism to criticize a lot of the things that were wrong with contemporary China. Shen Songwen's stories available in English include the three examples given here, the anthology from University of Hawaii Press, edited by Jeffrey Kinkley, a bilingual edition published by the Chinese University of Hong Kong, the novella Border Town, which I cover in that course on the modern Chinese novel, and you can find many more at the Ohio State University's Modern Chinese Literature and Culture website. So just to sum up, Shen's literary reputation is primarily as a lyricist, someone who really had a poetic sensibility. He used a lot of colloquial language, he didn't use a lot of the chengyu or set phrases that some writers would just fall back on. And he was also famous particularly for his evocations of place and the place on the border of Hunan and Sichuan province, and really capturing that feeling and sensibility of a place that most people had not visited. And many of his readers in, say, urban China was, was mostly a place of mind for them. And so they really experienced it through his evocations and his reconstructions. So although he's often talked about as being a nativist or native soil writer, he's not connected to the soil so much as to the river, as we'll see with uh, the story Border Town. He was also very influenced by uh, Western writers such, and thinkers such as uh, Sigmund Freud and Faulkner. And so we get the sense of place and this intense interest in the psychology of characters coming through. So he was a very cosmopolitan writer but one who followed his own path. And I think that he has intrigued generations of writers partly because he is so different from everyone else. He's not purely Chinese or purely Western. Uh, he is very much an autodidact. He wasn't just a socialist or a realist. There's a lot of fantasy. There's a lot of tales of the strange or zhi guai in his sensibility. He wasn't uh, enamored of the communist cause and he wasn't yet another urban writer, you know, rehashing the same tropes over and over. So you can find many great studies of Shen Song Wen. I'd recommend Jeff Kinkley's biography, the chapter in C.T. Xia's seminal work on the history of modern Chinese fiction that helped to put Shen Song Wen on many people's radar. David Wong devotes one third of his book to Shen Song Wen. It's well worth reading if you want to understand the realist side of Shen Song Wen, as well as some recent anthologies. So you can find many, many more. And if that's not enough, you want to read more and you read Chinese, I would suggest the complete works of Shen Song Wen. Although I would have an asterisk or a caveat there since no complete works can ever really be complete. We have editors leaving things out for political reasons. We have descendants leaving things out so as not to embarrass their famous ancestor. And so uh, we'll be coming back to that point again, but happy reading. Shen Song Wen is a wonderful writer to discover for the first time.